Hi, I'm Sam Worcester and I'm a project officer at the Inner Northern Local Learning and Employment Network. And today I'm going to be speaking to Luke. Luke, did you want to uh, introduce yourself and uh, tell us what you're doing currently? Okay, yeah, g'day. Uh, I'm Luke. I'm a designer and owner at Into Carico. Um, been working on this project for a couple of years and we're just about to launch. Um, basically, we make bags from recycled materials, um, kind of focused around the urban environment and urban community. Yeah. Oh, very good. So, look, obviously, it's been some time since you've left school. Why don't you talk us through um, your experience in secondary school and sort of maybe how that sort of shaped the direction that you went after school. So what were some of the subjects that you studied or what were some significant factors when you were at school that sort of started you on your, you know, your career path? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, from a young age, I always had an interest in drawing and creating and just kind of making little things. Um, so I always kind of knew uh, that I would go down something around that path. Um, somewhere in the kind of like art creative field. Uh, I never had any idea what it was, but fortunately my parents um, kind of guided me a little bit and we did a um, studio arts and visual communication with the two pillars that I did at uh, high school that kind of guided me and uh, they teach you actually quite a lot about um, what's actually practical application in the real world, yeah. um, which was really good preparing yourself for university. Uh, so I did those through VCE, which were really fundamental, um, actually against a lot of people's recommendations. People say two folio subjects are just a bit too time consuming and they can become a detriment to your grades and your other academic classes. Um, but I guess the benefit there is, um, you know, follow-up and things are, are things that I was quite passionate about and, and it kind of, I enjoyed doing them so it wasn't necessarily work. Um, so I ended up graduating there and fortunately being able to get into RMIT University um, and studied mm -hmm. industrial design. Yep. Um, so that was a good pathway to lead into that. And in secondary school, uh, what were some little moments, say, that sort of really... Is there any moments that kind of really uh, made you... made it clear to you that you wanted to, you know, study design at university? Like, what were some... Thinking back, what were some significant little moments or projects that you worked on that, um, sp you know, that fueled this interest in, you know, in, des in design? Yeah, there, there was definitely one, one case study, one project we did in visual communication um, that basically took us through the whole design project um, process from beginning to end. Uh, and at that stage, I just liked drawing and making stuff. I didn't really think about any kind of real world application of it. And the way that you could use colors and forms and shapes to actually influence people's behavior and the way that people interact with a product. And it's things that you don't realize as a consumer. Um, but when you go to, you know, turn on a, a lawnmower or pick up a backpack, there's, there's a set of visual language that's being designed in that object so that you inherently know how to interact with it. So for example, like on a bag, the, the strap might be made from cork or some kind of nice material that invites you to want to touch it. So instinctively, you know, that's where I, that's where I pick that bag up. Uh, and other things in more complex products might use color. So maybe with a lawnmower, for example, every piece that you actually meant to interact with, every piece that you touch might be blue. And then, you know, of the classic thing is like, the emergency kill switch is, you know, going to be bright red or bright orange or something like that. Mm -hmm. So all of these pieces of, of visual communication that you just kind of, you're not necessarily clued into until you, you realise that someone actually has sat there and thought about that 
And that is mm. the way that it is for a very specific reason. Um, so that drove me to, to choose design over at that stage what was a little bit more art or creative focus. Um, yeah. So painting or sculpture or something like that because um, I just really enjoyed that practicality. Uh, yeah. But still kept building the folio out in, in both directions. Yeah, and they both obviously complement each other. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So in hindsight, what were some significant decisions that you made in secondary school uh, when thinking about you know, your time at school and what was going to happen after secondary school? Uh, yeah, I guess the, the biggest decision was, um, cause a lot of, a lot of design courses and a lot of, um, creative focused courses don't necessarily rely so much on your ATAR score. Um, right. in specifically the course that I got into, um, didn't actually look at it at all. They didn't even consider it. Um, okay. but that was why I made the choice to do two folio based projects because what they're essentially looking at is number one like the, your person and, and who who you are and your work ethic and things like that um and there's you know tests and exams and stuff to to get you through that part but the largest part is your folio base and your skill set uh and probably more importantly how how you think and how you solve problems specifically for yeah. for industrial Being able to do two of those subjects and really build that folio out in a nice, diverse range of mediums and, and ways of thinking was really instrumental to, to getting into that course um, and a couple of others opportunities at the same time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So do you feel like there was uh, external pressures from friends, family or teachers to put in some more of the academic subjects or do you feel like you were supported and uh, you know, if you felt that pressure, how did you sort of deal with that? Uh, yeah, I, I did feel the pressure. Um, but I, I guess I've always felt like I was a little bit advantaged in the way that I, I had a clear idea that I didn't want to do, I didn't want to be an accountant or something like that. You know, I was, I was very um, stubborn in the fact that I wanted to do something in the creative field. Uh, and mm -hmm. from then, I guess it was just a little bit more what's that going to be and what's that going to look like? So as much as people were saying, don't do two folio subjects, it just kind of made sense to me. You know, it, it didn't matter if I sat there for my whole holidays and just painted different kinds of watercolors and played with different mediums and, you know, sketched up a hundred different chairs with different wood tones and things like that. I just enjoyed yeah. doing that stuff. Um, whereas if you were approaching that from this is work, it would be somewhat torturous. You know, I don't want to, yeah. I didn't want to sit there for my whole two week holiday and do accounting equations. Um, mm -hmm. so just, it was something that I enjoyed and that, and that, that again, like was, is quite fortunate, um, to have that clarity at that age, I guess. Yeah. Um, but there's still a lot that comes to how you're actually going to put that into a real world scenario. Yeah. So you're, I guess you're able to block out all those pressures and just focused on your interest and to, yeah, focus on what you're doing and forget what everybody else is sort of saying and obviously being supported along the way, but just being, you know, backing yourself, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, it, for, for that specifically, it actually can, can end up in your favour. Because um, if you do do well in those folders, you can still end up getting quite a good score. Um, it doesn't necessarily harm your ATAR score at all. If anything, it could mm -hmm. potentially benefit if you are willing to do the, the work for it. Yeah. And so you get through school, you, do your, you focus on your two folio subjects, you get in. You get into a university course. What what did you study, and what other options did you have at that time, or did you just have one offer and then you took it? How did you make that decision? 
Uh, I had come coming out of uni. There was a couple of of options um, for different universities, and I actually changed last minute to switch into industrial design after talking to a few more people um, mm -hmm. that knew kind of what I was interested in, what my skill set was. They recommended that I should go down that. Um, so mm -hmm. switched very very late in the game over to to RMIT industrial design, uh, yeah. which was a really great move. Um, it's a fantastic course that teaches you a lot about how to think and how to solve problems. Uh, and there's a lot of applications on skills and things that you need to be employable um, within the workforce. Uh, yeah, I just went straight from from year 12 straight into, into uni. Um, so I didn't have a gap year or anything, just wanted to dive into it. Yeah, and what were the other courses that you were considering? at the time? So there was a communication design course, um, some product design courses, uh, graphic design, um, you know, even some kind of architecture and interior architecture, uh, mm -hmm. anything focused around that creative space. Um, but, you know, piggybacking off that, that practicality that I was talking about earlier in the way that you can design an object. Industrial design was was the clearest form of that. Um, yeah. And it was kind of the the pinnacle of that that course at the time. Um, so yeah, it kind of just made sense to go into that. Um, yeah, and if we'll get to more in, to industrial design, but just firstly, what firstly, what did you, what if you were to pick another course that wasn't industrial design, what, what would that be if you had to? Uh, probably communication design, uh, which is essentially the same thing. Um, well, in my understanding of it anyway, is essentially the same thing, but in a 2D form rather than 3D. So it's, yeah. it's telling you, it's communi communicating information to you, um, you know, through um, copy and text and typography and colors and forms and shapes and things. Um, so it guides your, your eyes around the page and gives you a hierarchy, um, the same way a product does, but just solely information based. Okay. And so you've chosen industrial design and you get to university and you're sort of a few weeks in. What are some of the first things that you realize about the differences between studying at say year 11 and 12 to say being at first year university, how did that, how did that um, process go and what were some of the challenges and what were some of the things that you enjoyed? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, it was a bit of a shock to be honest. Mm. Um, it was much more intense and much higher competition than what I was used to. Uh, and also, there's so many more students um, than there was uh, teachers. So I was used to, you know, it being in a class of 20 and kind of having a lot of questions and time with your, your teacher. Uh, and you go to, you know, a class of 100 um, where you're a bit of a smaller, smaller fish in a bigger pond. Uh, and you've obviously condensed your... Uh, classmates down to everyone else around the country and you know around the world that really want to do this as well um, so you come from being I guess you know a big fish in a small pond to a, a small fish in a big pond um, and that was that took a little bit of getting used to it was really good um, it, it was tough I guess you know coinciding with that is moving from the country down to Melbourne. So there was a lot of stuff outside of uni that I was having to learn at the same time. But on the actual course and what that taught you, it was really, really great. The, um, the way they structure it is the first uh, two semesters are very, very skill-based um, and it's very, very intense in the workload, which is, I guess, a way to kind of filter out people that don't necessarily want to be there. Um, and that, you know, you're learning all these new computer programs, you're diving into really detailed um, product and rapid 
conceptualization drawings um, and you're surrounded by all these other people that love the exact same thing. Uh, so that was really cool. Um, we also did a lot of kind of practical kind of prototyping hands-on things in the workshop, which was great um, to catch back up, I guess. Um, it was a bit of a shock seeing, you know, how amazing all these other people were. It was great. Yeah. And I guess you're learning from everybody around you and it's quite an intense environment, you could say, you know, coming straight out of school. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and, and, you know, re the, the reason that I did industrial design um, was the diversity of the output and the diversity of the jobs that you can get at the end of that, yep. that course. So it's very broad from, say, like an automotive designer to um, you know, service design or product design. Um, so there's a lot of applications that you can you can get employed with with that skill set, and that means yeah. that you have a really broad um, group of classmates. So a lot of different interests yeah. and a lot of different skills. Um, yeah. And just touching on what you sort of alluded to before, um, once you started, you know, your first year of university and you've left school and you've moved into a new place of residence, what, how did uh, the challenges outside of school impact the, your time at university? And if you were to do it again, what, how would you do it differently in terms of managing your university and managing your things outside of university? Yeah, that, uh, probably the simplest answer to that question would be probably take, take a gap year and go and do some traveling okay. and kind of blow off some steam. Um, mm -hmm. You know, being, being 18 and moving from the country down into the city is, you know, a bit overwhelming and a bit stimulating. Um, so we yeah. did a, probably didn't focus on my studies as much as I should have for the first year. Um, mm -hmm. But still, you know, managed to get through and and do uh, well enough to get onto the next year where I started to focus a little bit more. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, a gap year is something that I've always thought about. Maybe that was a good idea to do. Um, yeah. Because, yeah, that, that our lecturer said to us at the start of the course um, that it's a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, yeah. And I didn't really know what he meant by that at the time. But then as the course went on, yeah. I started to make a whole lot of sense and become really clear. Yeah. So you've finished, you've finished your course and you have obviously worked s some other jobs in between where you are right now. Do you just want to talk us, you know, talk us through finishing the course, how you got your first job after that and sort of just kind of a brief overview of where you leaving university and to where you are now? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so a brief rundown is... I got a job at a bespoke lighting design studio in Melbourne halfway through my final year of uni. Um, so I worked that part time and then literally the day after I finished uni started full time work there um, and was there for two years. It was a nice small studio which was really great first year out of uni because you get a really diverse uh, set of skills and, and roles that have that you don't get taught at uni, things that are more practical workforce based, like mm -hmm. how to write a proper email and how to deal with suppliers and clients and manage timelines and inventory and things like that. Um, so that was really great to be in a small studio. But the, the downside of that was after a couple of years, you've kind of learnt as much as you can from that environment. Um, so I got a little bit a um, little bit kind of itchy and wanted to go out and, and explore some other things. And at that time, I'd gone from high school straight into uni, straight into the workforce. So I hadn't really had any, any time off or done any kind of real traveling or exploring. Uh, and I'd, I'd also just followed, I guess, what I thought was the path that I was meant to do. Um, you know, you, you finish school, you go to uni, and then you get a job that's really relevant to that course that you've just done. Uh, and I, 
it's not that I wasn't happy, but I just wanted to explore other options to make sure that this was what I was going to do. Uh, and I knew it was still going to be in the creative field. So I just started kind of tinkering and playing around with, with different ideas. Uh, and that's how I eventually ended up um, doing the current role that I'm doing now, which is um, making bags from recycled materials. Um, and there's a lot of other things involved in that. If anyone's interested, you can check it out, but I won't go into it now. Uh, but the pivotal moment there, I guess, was going through going through uh, university, you're kind of learning about all these amazing um, products and things that have been made in the past that shaped our society today. And kind of looking forward to the future, as at least in the physical product realm, it seemed a little bit kind of like everything was sort of done and everyone was really excited and focused on more of the digital side of things. Um, so technology and, you know, like, iPhones had only been out for a, a little while at that stage and you know service design and um, UX design was was really kind of starting to explode and That was something that didn't interest in, interest me all that much. I, I wanted to be hands-on and I wanted to be physically making things um, so kind of having this epiphany probably in hindsight a little bit too late that the way that we make and manufacture products is fundamentally backwards um, mm -hmm. it's essentially just stripping resources from from the ground and then we use them for a very short period of time and, and throw them back mm -hmm. and the earth's got no idea how to digest these materials that we've just made um, and that's a really huge fundamental issue so very selfishly I was kind of like perfect here's a here's a physical product problem that is you know going to take at least a lifetime to solve that I can really dive into and kind of, you know, set the rest of my career on this trajectory. Um, so that was really exciting, but also, you know, quite terrible that it's a thing in the first place. Yeah. Well, you've obviously seen an opportunity and sort of followed, you know, your, you know, your gut and your intuition there. Um, Luke, if you were to give, advice to your 16 year old self uh what would that be you know if it was just a short bit of advice what would it be uh short bit of advice would be don't make career decisions based on what you think is the right choice uh and by that i mean you know the job that pays well or is going to be really secure or um you know think that you'll get good status from your from your peers or the people around you just kind of try and focus on on whatever it is that that you enjoy doing i mean it doesn't have to get you extremely excited every day um but yeah something that you enjoy doing and then workshop it from there so that's pretty good advice luke uh thanks for meeting on zoom today uh obviously it'll be better in person but we will adapt with the, the current times that we're in so thanks again and i'll leave a uh, a link to the bags that you're currently making obviously we've discussed them um, and i'm sure those viewing it would be interested to see so thanks again cool thanks sam